Hi, so the video you're about to see is me giving a video presentation to the AI modeling lab in Edinburgh about my summer internship project called Micrograd in Isabel. It's a bit rushed at the start because I was kind of in an informal conversation during the meeting, so it didn't make sense to give a formal presentation introduction. But now that I've cropped the video, it seems a bit weird that I kind of just like skate past the intro. So I'm adding this here to just preface the kind of rest of the video with that. So hope you enjoy if anyone watches this. My name's Alex Hyman and today I'd like to share with you my summer research project, Micrograd in Isabel, which was supervised by Jacques and was given lots of help from Philip. As you may have noticed, you know, like I'm away, so we're gonna have to do this on Zoom. Um, oh, oh. I, first, let me introduce the catalyst for the project, which made it all possible, Andrew Carpathy's Micrograd. As some of you may know, Karpathy is a computer scientist specialising in AI who made a Python programme called Micrograd a few years back. Micrograd offers a lightweight automatic differentiation engine, which in turn can be used to perform backpropagation on neural networks. He made it to show that backpropagation can be achieved using a very small amount of code. It achieves it in like a minimalist fashion. And one of the ways we can achieve backpropagation is through automatic differentiation, AD. Differentiation in general is an indispensable element of machine learning as it facilitates the optimization of a neural network through the tweaking of its parameters. Highly optimized ML libraries do exist. For example, we've got PyTorch and TensorFlow. However, due to their significant levels of optimization, their implementations are often lengthy, opaque, and quite challenging for the user to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. In a world where we're ever more reliant on AI, especially in safety critical scenarios, as some of you have talked about, the lack of transparency and comprehension of AI is becoming a major issue. This is why we're interested in a minimalist approach to AD, as it would be great to try and verify properties about the bedrock of machine learning without all the fluff. So what, what did we do? Well, over the summer, we formalized the Micrograd engine using the Isabel theorem proving slash functional language, notably with the use of something called the Imperative Hall library, which allowed us to use references within a functional programming context. By implementing Micrograd in Isabel, which is a programming language dedicated to formal verification, we now have a rigorous platform from which we can start to prove the correctness of AD algorithms and hopefully in turn, neural networks. Furthermore, Isabel has strong code generation facilities, which allowed us to compare the speed of our implementation to Carpathy's. This is useful as it grants us the ability to write neural network related programs in Isabel, prove theorems about those programs, and then generate a hopefully faithful copy of the program into a useful language, such as, but not limited to, Haskell. And of course, we then started proving theorems about micrograds. However, we were soon encountered with unexpected difficulties which arose from the use of referencing within functional programming. This is not a downside, however, as it has highlighted to us various ways in which Imperative Hall as a library can be improved. Moreover, it shows that seemingly innocent assumptions that we make when designing AD algorithms are actually much more complex than they let on. And so perhaps we should justify them more thoroughly. And that's precisely the reason we use Isabel to make ju um, thorough justifications. Now, of course, the object we're actually interested in differentiating is a computation graph. This is simply a graph which captures the structure of mathematical expressions, for example, a equals 2, B equals 3, C equals A plus B, D equals A times B, E equals C minus D. And as a technical note, there's usually a set of primitive operations which we can produce a system of equations uh, and create a computation graph. For example, this um, system of equations has addition, subtraction, multiplication and division uh, as its primitives. So using the same system as the previous slide, here is a visualization of the computation graph, which represents them. Uh, let me try and use a laser pointer. <laughs> Beginning on the left, we can see that A has been initialized to two, B to three, and then their data is passed through the operations which they're involved in, multiplication and addition. And then the values 
from multiplication and addition go into D and C respectively. And hopefully this is all very intuitive, how the data flows through a computation graph, right? So I won't labor the point. I want to draw your attention, however, to the fact that there is no primitive subtraction operation here, right? As is shown in the top right, E equals C minus D is really defined as E equals C plus negative one times D. This is why D and an unnamed uh, like node with data negative one get passed into the multiplication operator because instead of doing subtraction, we do addition with negative one times a number, okay? And of course, we could define everything primitively. We could have everything as a primitive operation, but in both our and Carpathy's implementations, we choose to keep the number of primitive operations low. This aids the simplicity of the design and also reduces the number of derivative rules which we must store in our program. And I'm going to get onto that later, why we would store derivative rules for our primitives. So Carpathy, he selects addition, subtraction, multiplication and ReLU as his primitives, whereas we swap out division for exponentiation. This difference in our selection of primitives is not totally arbitrary since our implementation requires the use of rational numbers, which once again, I'll explain why we need rational numbers later. The rational numbers aren't closed under exponentiation. For example, the square root of two is irrational, and therefore we cannot define rational exponentiation in Isabel. However, as Python only does floating point approximations of exponentiation, it doesn't care about this caveat, so he was able to do that. But it doesn't really matter. It won't affect the working of our program. So when concerned with the precise arithmetic involved in a computation, we usually opt for the previous type of diagram, which we call a raw computation graph. A variable dependency graph, on the other hand, is a simplified type of graph, which conveys the general structure of the computation without worrying about the details of the operators. So here's the variable dependency graph version of the previously shown raw computation graph. The main uh, thing to notice is that all the operator nodes and data values have been like subsumed into one node. Moreover, the direction of the edges has been reversed. In the raw computation graph, inputs pointed into outputs to emphasize the direction of the flow of data. In a variable dependency graph, the direction of the edges instead emphasize dependencies. As we can see, E is created from C and D in an operation. It depends on them. The reason we do this is because it allows for non-commutative operations, you know, where the, the order of the operands matters, for example, division or exponentiation. If the operands pointed to the outputs, there would be no real way to know what order the operands were used in the operation, which could be an issue. So we have it the other way around. The node with no edges, which is E in this graph, um, sorry, the node with no edges pointing into it is known as the root of the graph. In the context of neural nets, the loss function of the network will be the root of the underlying computation graph. And if a node X points to a node Y, then we say Y is a child of X. And technically speaking, computation graphs should actually be directed acyclic graphs. And that just means every edge has a direction and there should be no loops. And the reason we don't want any loops is because that ensures that a variable will never like depend on itself within a system of equations. OK, so that seems like a reasonable requirement. And now in automatic differentiation, we are interested in the gradient of each node within the computation graph. Given a computation graph G with a root node denoted by R, the gradient of a node X is just the partial derivative of R with respect to X partial r over partial x. <clears throat> Intuitively, the gradient of a node captures how sensitively the data of r, the root node, changes when the data of x changes. And hopefully you can see why this is relevant in the context of neural networks, where we wish to determine how sensitive the loss is to change in each parameter. In fact, this is the very essence of backpropagation. We calculate the gradients of the parameters of a network, we tweak their parameters in the opposite direction to their gradients, and we do this all to try and decrease the loss of the network and hopefully make the network better at solving the task at hand. And there's several ways you can actually calculate gradient. 
We've got symbolic differentiation, which is something we've probably all done in a calculus class gone by. However, this is expensive in practice, as often the expressions within large computation graphs become unwieldy. We've also got numerical differentiation, but these are unstable as small errors in approximations accumulate into much larger errors. There's like a snowballing effect of errors. And we've also got automatic differentiation, but this is good because it's numerically stable because it takes advantage of the structure of the computation graph it has at hand. And there's two main modes, right? There's forward or bottom up, and there's also reverse or top down automatic differentiation called FAD and RAD respectively. And within the context of neural networks, again, RAD performs better than FAD because it can calculate all the gradients of the network in one pass of the network, whereas FAD actually requires several passes. OK, so we're concerned with RAD. And the fundamental theorem underpinning all of RAD is the generalized chain rule. So I'm going to just quickly remind you uh, that let W be a differentiable function of M independent variables. And for each I, let X I be a differentiable function of N independent variables. Then we have that uh, the partial derivative of W with respect to TJ. It's just the partial derivative of W with respect to each of its variables multiplied by the partial derivative of the variable divided by the partial derivative of TJ. And then we just sum all those together. And what this uh, seemingly messy formula is saying is that it's just saying to find the derivative of W with respect to TJ, we really only need to know the derivative of W with respect to its variables, and we need to know the derivative of the variables with respect to TJ, okay? It actually kind of makes sense, like, why that should be the case. So here's the big idea. Notice the following. If we have a computation graph G, a root node R, an arbitrary node X in G, and we have nodes PI, which are the parents of X. And when I say they're the parents of X, I mean like X is their child or that a primitive operation applied to X gives you PI, okay? Then via the chain rule, the gradient of X, which remember is just the partial derivative of R with respect to X, is really the partial derivative of R with respect to the first parent times the partial derivative of the first parent with respect to X. And then we add, uh, we add the same thing, but for all parents. But behold, the partial derivatives PJ uh, on a partial derivative X are simple to calculate as PJ are just a primitive operation applied to X. So if we know the derivative rule associated with that primitive operation, then we know partial PJ on partial X. Perfect. And moreover, partial r over partial pj well they're just the gradients of pj all of this is to say that to find the gradient of a node x we only really need to know the gradients of its parents first this lends itself to rad being implemented recursively from the root node down or in such a way where the gradient of the node x is only calculated after the gradients of each of its parents have been calculated this could also be achieved using a topological sort, you know, which sorts out the graph based on the dependencies, based on um, who's a parent before a child. We decided to take the recursive approach as we believe it to be simpler and more in the spirit of functional programming, whereas Carpathy decided to use a topological sort in his implementation. And with that being said, let's dive into the code that Carpathy wrote. The object which behaves as the node within his computation graphs are value objects and their blueprint is shown in this class here. Value objects have self-explanatory fields, they have data and grad, but they also contain a personal function called underscore backwards, which I'll explain in more detail shortly, and another field called underscore prev, which is a set of pointers to the node's children, okay? And the way Carpathy builds a computation graph from these value objects is through arithmetic operations applied to them. So we're gonna inspect his multiplication method within the value class. It takes in two arguments, self and other. 
the first line just coerces the type of other into a value object, right? It's basically just some Python finagling. And then the next line creates a new value object whose data is unsurprisingly, because it's multiplication, it's self.data times other.data. And it also contains this tuple of self and other. It has pointers to its children, okay? Which is just the same as uh, the variable dependency graph we saw. Nodes have pointers to their children. And then within the mul method, we have the underscore backward method for out defined. Underscore backwards alters the gradients of its children, self and out, in accordance to the RAD algorithm outlined earlier. This is where we need to know the basic derivative rules um, of our primitive operations. The reason out.grad is multiplied by other.data and self.data here and there is because of the derivative rule for multiplication, which is right here. If out equals self times other, then the partial derivative of out with respect to self is other, and the partial derivative of out with respect to other is self. OK. So this backward function is doing an increment of its children's gradients, which is just one of the additions from the generalized chain rule formula, which was, if you remember, a sum of local partial derivatives multiplied by the gradient of their parents. So the big idea here is that for a value object V with parent PI, if the gradient of each PI, each of the parents has been calculated, then by calling PI dot backward for each parent, the gradient of V will be correctly calculated. And that's all it is. The method, that's basically the RED algorithm there. And the methods for addition, subtraction, et cetera, they're all defined similarly, with the only real differences being how out is instantiated with its data, and as well as how the underscore backward function is defined, because it'll be a different local partial derivative based on the derivative rule for the primitive operation. So with this in mind, let's look at Karpathy's backward function, his RAD algorithm. The first chunk from here to there just produces a topological sort of the graph to ensure that the gradients are calculated in, sa in a safe order, i.e. we never try and calculate a gradient on a node before all its parents' gradients have been calculated. The next chunk of code just calls underscore backward with respect to the topological sort, which, as discussed, ensures that we only increment the gradient of a node after all its parents' gradients have already been calculated. And once we've done all this, all the additions in the generalized chain rule will have been applied to each node and therefore we will have calculated the gradient for each node. OK, so we're just calling underscore backwards on a values parent to update the gradient of that value. And before we look at our implementation, I just want to note that Python is a hybrid programming language which incorporates both functional and imperative programming paradigms. So the conversion from Python to Isabel is certainly not trivial. Micrograd makes use of referencing throughout, for example, you know, like each value object has pointers to its children. And because referencing does not typically exist in most vanilla functional languages, um, because of data needing to be immutable, this is going to be an issue in our conversion. At first, we did try to do this purely functionally. However, as you can hopefully see, with the idea of nodes pointing to other nodes, the notion of referencing is almost unavoidable, right? Functional automatic differentiation algorithms, algorithms do exist. For example, Connell Elliott did achieve one using category theory. However, we've not gone down this route, not only because of difficulty, but also because of what we're trying to emulate. To maintain faithfulness to Carpathy's work, we make use of the imperative hall framework, which allows the use of referencing by wrapping all reference related operations in something called the heap monad. This just basically handles potential errors to do with references in a functional manner. And in general, that's what monads typically do within a functional language. They just handle potential errors of computations in a functional manner. So with that being said, I can now move on to my implementation. Um, starting with how we defined the value class. 
So as is common in many functional programming languages, the idea of a class in an OOP sense doesn't exist. This is not an issue, however, as the value class in Carpathy's Micrograd can be closely mimicked using Isabel's algebraic data types. So first we need to define a data type called operation in Isabel, which represents the mathematical operation, which is going to produce the yet to be defined element from the data type val. So the constructors of operation, nothing, mult, plus, div, u minus, relu, they're all the primitives that can be used to build the computation graph. And the arguments of these constructors are simply the operands, right? Nothing special here. Malt has two arguments because it's binary. U minus is unary, so it only has one argument. And we should probably note that the nullary or zero argument constructor, nothing, just represents when the programmer would wish to instantiate a variable. For example, saying let x equal two. So with the operation data type defined, I can now give you the val data type. So the data and grad fields are analogous to Carpathy's implementation. There's nothing new going on there. And as a note, to maintain generality, the val objects are defined with a polymorphic type, prime v val, but in all cases in our project, we'll deal with the concrete type, rat val, where rat stands for rational. The opera field has type prime v val ref operation. Right, which means the children of a node and the operands in an operation will be references to other val objects. That is to say that the children are not just val objects. Otherwise, the opera field would have type prime v val operation, right? There would be no ref there, but we are using ref. We're going to do everything by reference. We're going to have references to val objects. And this is all done with the intention of being similar to the, chill, uh, the underscore prev field in Carpathy's micrograd. So now I just want to digress for a second to talk about one of the main limitations of imperative hall, the fact that not all types can be referenced. Suppose we have a value V with a reference R. In imperative hall, R is a natural number which represents the address in the heap which stores the value V. However, it turns out that the heap does not actually store V, but rather a natural number which represents V. Therefore, the type of V must be encodable or representable by the natural numbers, i.e. we need to say we need to show that the type is countable. And because we want to reference both val and operation data types, we need to prove in Isabel that they are countable. Ideally, we would want our program to work with val objects which have real number data. However, since the reals are an uncountable type, we must instead settle for val objects with rational data. This is not a prohibitive restriction, however, as we would have to map reals, like mathematical reals in Isabel, to floats, right, whenever we made a, uh, whenever we did code generation. And floats are just rational numbers in disguise. OK, so it's not going to be too much of an issue using rationals. And with that over, let's now see how we actually build computation graphs in Isabel. <clears throat> As with Carpathy's work, building the computation graph applies, it involves applying operations on val objects. The function init value takes a rational x and just returns the reference to a val object with data x. OK, so it's wrapping a val object in a reference. The function add values takes two references uh, to val objects as arguments. And it's important that we don't pass the arguments by value because almost all of Carpathy's functions also handle their arguments by reference. So I'm just trying to labor the point. We're doing everything by reference. Add values returns a reference to a new val object, which is produced by the addition of the two given references. That's what we can see here. However, the return type is a rat val ref heap, which uh, kind of sounds like a Dr. Zeus poem or something. Uh, and it's not just rat val ref. And this is because imperative hall requires that the output of a function is wrapped in the heap monad, okay? because it makes use of reference related operations, which once again, they could fail. 
And just for people in the Isabel know how, if they're confused by certain keywords, um, the pa partial function heap just handles heap monad returns. Heap, yeah, since they can result in non-termination. And also we might notice that the syntax for functions looks very different. And this is because Imperative Hall implements do block syntactic sugar in conjunction with its heap monad operations. But this is almost identical to the, to the way Haskell does do block syntactic sugar. So maybe it's not too much of a shock for functional programmers. So here's how we actually construct a computation graph in it as well. We use the letter R, right, at the start of every uh, variable name to emphasize that every variable here is a reference to a val object and not just a val object. And in fact, this is the computation graph we looked at earlier, right? So it, it's pretty self-explanatory. We initialize the values A and B, we then add the values A and B, and we multiply them, and then we subtract them, and then we get a reference to E, right? And that is a computation graph in Isabel. So far, all very similar, all good. The main difference, however, in implementations is the backward function. Recall that Carpathy chooses to have an internal method called underscore backward for each value object in the computation graph. And when it's called, it increments the gradients of the object's children under the assumption that the object's gradient has been correctly calculated. <coughs> to perform RAD, Carpathy performs a topological sort and then calls underscore backwards on each node in the graph with respect to the safe topological ordering. Sadly, we cannot have an internal underscore backward method for each val object in Isabel, as this would make them unencodable by the naturals, and that means we couldn't reference them in imperative hall. Instead, we follow the exact same idea as his algorithm, but instead of explicitly performing a topological sort in the CG, we simply recurse from the root node down the CG which implicitly ensures that the parent's gradient has always been calculated before its child. So how do we do RAD recursively? Well, the generalized chain rule can be interpreted within the context of computation graphs as saying that the gradient of a node V is the sum of the products of the local partial derivatives at each node visited on each path to V. For example, suppose R is the root of a computation graph and there exist two paths from R to V. We can go via A, then B, then V, and we can also go via C, then D, then V. Then by the generalized chain rule, we would have this formula, R to A, A to B, B to V, that's one path. So we multiply the local partial derivatives encountered along the path, and then we add it, to the product of local partial derivatives encountered on the second path. So here's just a diagram to eliminate potential confusion. We're going from R to A to B to V, and we're multiplying the local partial derivatives along the way, which is, gives us this first product. And then we do the exact same for the second path, which is why that gives us this second product. You do this for all paths, and then you sum those products and you now have the gradient of V. So by recursing down the computation graph from the root node to the leaves of the CG, i.e. val objects with operation nothing, okay, those are the leaves of the CG, we will have explored every path in the computation graph and, update the, and we will have updated the gradients accordingly. And hopefully this means that our definition for the backward function should not be too unnatural. First, we in, so uh, to call, we call backward path value r. That's how we like call the function. And first, it increments the gradient of the current node r by the current path value or the path product. Okay. Then we perform a case split on the val object since every operation has a different like derivative rule and therefore the local partial derivative is going to be different okay so that's why we're case splitting on like plus u minus mult i've left out a few operators here but it's all the same then we multiply the path value by the local partial derivative so for addition the local partial derivative is just one so it's one times the path value for example and then finally we call backward 
recursively on the children of, e of the current node. So hopefully you can see that when you call this recursively on the children, that's then going to increment the gradients of the children by the new path value, okay? Which is exactly what Kirpathy is doing when he calls underscore backwards. So it's all the same. And to actually perform our RAD algorithm in totality uh, on a computation graph with root node R, we simply just call backward one R, okay? And with this, this means we can already create a simple library for producing neural networks. And armed with an RAD algorithm, we can perform back propagation on the neural networks to optimize them. I'm just going to summarize Carpathy's neural network implementation, noting where ours differs, okay? So as is the norm, Carpathy initializes a neuron with a list of randomized weights and a bias set to zero and a Boolean flag called non-lin, which just indicates whether the output of a neuron should be passed through a non-linear activation function. Our neuron data type is almost identical. However, when we initialize our neurons, the bias and weights need to be given explicitly. They're not just randomized because it doesn't really make sense to produce random numbers in Isabel. Kirpathy's neuron call just does a weighted sum on the given inputs, it then adds the bias and then chooses whether to pass the output through a nonlinear activation function. This is the standard way that a neuron like fires in a neural network. And just one final note, when he does this, he makes use of Python's native list comprehension capabilities and the sum function. To match this, we just use a function called map some monads, which allows us to do the same thing with our Isabel computation graph primitives and it does it all in one list, one list traversal for efficiency. The implementation of the types layer and MLP, right, are very easy. A layer is simply a list of neuron references and an MLP is simply a list of layers. And to call the MLP, it's just done by recursively calling, uh, applying call layer on the head of the layer list um, to the data. Right. So visually, this is just the idea of data flowing through the network from layer to layer to layer, getting called at each point until it pops out at the other end and you have your output Okay, of the MLP. Nothing special going on. So to demonstrate the power of the RAD algorithm at training simple neural networks, Karpathy provided a demo where the network solves a nonlinear decision boundary problem with the data set and neural network solution, uh, solution shown below, right? For this demo to work, right, the last thing we need to do is create a loss function for the neural network with respect to the problem we want it to solve, which is this nonlinear decision boundary problem. Ultimately, we want a computation graph of the network's call with the loss function at the root so that we can use the backward function and then tweak the parameters to try and minimize the loss function. We achieve this by first calling the MLP on the list of inputs. This produces a CG and then we pass the output from the MLP call, which is the root of the first CG through the loss function, which is composed from primitives. And this produces just an extension of the first CG whose root is now the loss of the network, right? So in the end of it all, we will have this large computation graph where the root is the loss function, right? And it was derived from the neural network call on the inputs. An important point to highlight is that in both implementations, the underlying computation graph is rebuilt from scratch every time the MLP is called and then passed into the loss function. But because the arithmetic structure of the underlying computation graph never changes, we could reuse the same CG repeatedly to optimize performance. We did provide such a function granting us this ability. However, to maintain similarity to Karpathy's demo, which in turn tries to emulate the inner workings of PyTorch, we have opted for the dynamic generation of computation graphs rather than a static generation. And I just wanted to quickly draw your attention to how the loss function for this demo was actually constructed in both Python and Isabel. 
I'm not going to go into the gory details, but we can see that it takes roughly the same number of lines for both implementations. And if you were to actually inspect each one, you would basically see that the Isabel code is an almost direct copy of the Python code, okay? Carpathy trains his network, right, I, with the loss function in the standard fashion. He zeroes the model, or he zeroes the gradients of the network, I should say. He calls backward, which inside implicitly calls, fo calls forward. And then uh, to calculate to calculate the new gradients and then using an increasing learning rate, he alters the parameters by the gradient scaled by the learning rate. And he just does this 100 times. He's tweaking the parameters to try and minimize the loss. Here's the Isabel implementation of the train function and it implements backpropagation as expected. One, it resets the gradients of the MLP. Then it generates the computation graph with the loss function as its root node. Then it calculates the gradients of every node in the computation graph of the network. That's the backward one loss. And then finally, it alters the data of each parameter. That's this incur data. Uh, based on the gradient. That's why there's this get grad. This is not an exact copy of the optimization of the network in the slide before, but it's pretty close to it. It's just the learning rate isn't changing, although we did do this. So what were the results from ours versus his? Well, as mentioned, one of the main advantages of Isabel as a theorem proving language is that it allows cogeneration into other functional programming languages such as Haskell or Camel and Scala. We've chosen to generate Haskell code from our implementation with the choice to map the Isabel type rat to the Haskell type double, as opposed to some native rational type. And this gave us major performance gains. When Karpathy's demo is running using the Python 3 command and terminal, it averages about 110 seconds to complete its output. The experiment repeated in Haskell by compiling the file using GHC and then running the executable takes only 37 seconds which is pretty great because it only it not only shows that we succeeded in staying relatively faithful to Carpathy's micrograd uh, because we didn't accidentally make a very inefficient mistake along the way, but it also means that we have a working reverse mode differentiation engine in Isabel, which we can then go on to formally verify. This is pretty cool. And of course, now we wish to verify a myriad of properties about RAD and neural networks. But sadly, since this internship was only over the summer, there does still remain a lot to be proven. And during this project, it took us a while, but we realized that the use of imperative hall makes theorem proving very different from vanilla proofs in Isabel, as now we are reasoning about a stateful or imperative program rather than something purely functional. So why is proving an imperative hall tricky? Well, proofs which involve imperative hall need to worry about the heap and how it changes as we inspect the effects of the application of different heap monadic functions. For example, weirdly, it is non-trivial to even show that heap monadic functions, such as add values, do not affect any pre-existing references on the heap, even though it seems obvious to us, right, as the programmer, right? It's just adding a value to the heap. It's not going to change anything already on it. Additionally, Imperative Hall doesn't have an extensive library of proven theorems, and so Isabel's automated provers, Sledgehammer, may fail to prove statements which seem simple. And finally, since do blocks are syntactic sugar for lots of function compositions, current automated tools struggle quite a bit because of the high number of functional compositions within like a do block. So I want to give you uh, an example of something that we need to prove in Isabel the soundness of computation graphs. One of the main assumptions that we would need in any of our proofs is that the CG we are dealing with is valid in its construction. That is to say, the data stored at every node is correct given the arithmetic involved in creating that node, okay? This is because when using references, we can change the data of nodes as we please. So we could potentially be naughty and change the data of a random node in the computation graph and it would actually be unsound in, it, in its structure. So we have this uh, desirable lemma 
mechanized in Isabel called add values valid, which I'm going to briefly explain. The first two assumptions assume that the references are present on the heap. This is because by the way heap in imperative hall is defined, it is possible to have a reference R which points to an address beyond the heap limit, i.e. an address that has not had a meaningful value assigned to it, but that will, it will still, the address will still contain a natural number representing a value, but just a meaningless value nonetheless, okay? So we need to make sure the reference is actually present, right? Like there's a meaningful value stored at that address. The imperative all predicate effect provides a simple relational calculus for ca computations on the heap. The term effect CH H prime R, it just simply means that a computation C was performed on an, on an initial heap H, it produced a result R, and now our new uh, heap is called H prime, okay? And therefore, the next three assumptions are just checking that the two uh, children involved in the operation are valid, and that when you add them together, the created, the new reference, outval ref, is also, um, well, it's on the heap. And then our goal is to show that outval ref is a valid reference, okay? We basically want to show that add values preserves validity, okay? It maintains the soundness of the computation graph. We did prove this lemma with the assumption of two other lemmas, which just state that if operands are valid before an addition, then they should remain valid after the uh, addition. And that makes intuitive sense. In fact, it almost seems obvious. So that one of those lemmas is shown here. This is different from add values valid, I just want to underline, as it shows that val ref one is valid, not that the out val ref is valid, right? So it's one of the children in the addition operation is valid. This should be an easier goal to prove. Unfortunately, this is actually surprisingly hard to prove since add values, it technically does change the heap because it adds a reference to it. It just doesn't change anything pre-existing on it, okay? And since imperative hall doesn't provide many tools pertaining to references on the heap specifically, showing a proof for this is actually quite non-trivial. Luckily, we can still make use of this lemma using the keyword sorry for exploratory purposes, right? So we don't need to give a proof in Isabel. And I did, uh, I showed this innocuous looking lemma to demonstrate how trivial things are often not that trivial, especially in Isabel. This means that I have quite the wish list for things I want to prove about Micrograd in Isabel. I would love to prove that all the primitive operation functions, uh, for example, add values, preserves the validity of references. Since init value initializes a, a valid reference, right? It's just building a reference out of nothing. By induction, the building of computation graphs in call neuron should be sound, okay? And I think we're actually getting quite close to that. Of course, I'd also like to show that our RAD, RAD algorithm calculates the correct gradients. This can be shown using induction once again. If the path value is correct at this point, then calling backward path value R increments the gradients of R's children by the correct amount with respect to the generalized chain rule. I'd also like to show that the neural network libraries methods such as call neuron work as expected. And if I was being really cheeky, what I'd love to prove is that uh, I'd love to show that the loss function for a neural network converges to a local minimum, given some conditions, after applying train an infinite number of times. This would be really great because this means we could analyze generic properties of neural networks using our implement Isabel implementation, okay? And with that all in mind, I just wanna give some concluding thoughts. You know, th this internship over the summer, it was a blast because it was my first and hopefully not last experience of what academic research feels like. There was many times where I thought I wasn't getting anywhere at all. However, sooner or later, something new did develop, which was lovely. I'm very happy about what we achieved. You know, we built a working RED engine and simple neural network in Isabel. And I'm not too dismayed about how there is still a lot of stuff to do on the theorem proving side as this means, you know, the project is still not over. I'm still thinking about it. 
ultimately, I learned how important Isabel and theorem proving languages in general are when it comes to the future of mathematics and computer science. Even with seemingly rigorous levels of just justification, mathematical justification, we often miss hidden or non-trivial assumptions in our work. And now that I'm back in the university, I've realised how effective Isabel could be at truly verifying whether we have dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's as mathematicians and computer scientists, especially in fields where extremely unintuitive things occur, for example, in measure theory. And of course, it would be ridiculous to expect humans to become pedantic down to the very atomic level of their work. And so theorem proving languages seem like the natural way to deal with this dichotomy between development of creative novel mathematics and formal verification. So I think they're really awesome. I just want to thank Jacques for offering me the opportunity to work under him this summer and for all that guidance, you know, he gave me along the way, as without him, I'd be very lost. I also owe a great deal of thanks to Philip, who spent many hours of their time pouring through my badly written code and trying to figure out why Isabel was just freaking out. And finally, thank you to Mark and Matt for listening to my unclear explanations, you know, like all summer long. Uh, and I guess I can now extend that to everyone here today. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, if you have any questions. I'm Pleasure working with you over this time. A very good talk. Any questions from anybody here? Mark? Uh, yeah, go back to slide number three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which land? Oh, the 2070. That's no rainbow. Slide 43, line. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, did you say slide three? No, 40, 43. 43. 43. 43. Sorry. Um, I was like, how are you remembering yeah, yeah. slide? Three. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Hey, Grant. Um, you said that imperative hold doesn't provide many tools or lemmas that would, they're helping with the theorem proving that you've got to do. Uh, do you have any ideas for things you for, for things that would make that easier for you? For any tools that you could maybe think about developing yourself? Uh, I mean, so yeah. So uh, Philip actually sent me an email yesterday saying that um, you know uh, there were certain things we could do with another. Um, I think like automated tool that is in the archive for formal proofs called auto two and auto two uh, helps prove things with imperative all. So I believe there are more tools available that uh, we're starting to realize, but there's quite a lot of like finicky setup um, and this could allow us to create new theorems, right? In imperative hall and like make them like, um, we could automate them, I believe. So yeah, I've not looked into it too deeply uh, since the summer, but it seems that there are things we can do uh, to try and create new theorems which can be automated in a certain way using this auto two library. I mean, Philip, do you, um, do you know that is it is it auto two that uh, seems like it could be quite promising in terms there's, of there's two that one? It's uh, there's auto two which is a whole like uh, evolution of the automatic tools there, uh, and yeah, it is really finicky to uh, <coughs> set up properly to do stuff but it also Smart. crucially comes with a massive library of facts right. and one of those libraries is separation logic for uh imperative hall right. separation logic is meant to be used for reasoning about heap properties sure. and form, yeah. but it wasn't in the isabel distribution it was right. in this random other archive form of <laughs> session <laughs> that seems to be helping yes. but it is trustworthy right oh, yeah, it's fully verified yeah. all right Oh. Any, other, no, that's great. That's any other questions from anybody else? So I'll, I'll put a question. Um, so for the functional implementation, uh, when you do recursion, there's a, always an opportunity to repeat the same work again and again. So do you do some kind of memoization to avoid that repeated work? Um, so could we, I'm not sure if, because of the way the recursion works, because like thinking of very like basic examples of recursion, um, I don't think memoization would work. We're using the recursion to travel uh, down through a computation graph. We yes. we never would call the same function like twice. It's not like recursively calculating Fibonacci numbers where we're doing the same thing multiple times because the data and gradients involved in the recursive computation 
change every time uh, because it's a CG which is like updating. So I, I don't believe memoization would help. I think we do have to recurse all the way down. But I also don't think it's a concern that memoization wouldn't work because we need to use this recursion and we need to pass through the entire thing every time because that, as I said, the recursion implicitly does the topological sort, which Carpathy does uh, for us. So I, I believe it's necessary to recurse through the entire computation graph uh, every time. And there's no way that memoization could be involved, uh, could be implemented rather. D does that does that make sense? Just like a hand wavy explanation? So, I think so, so here's, here's a viewpoint. So it could be that your recursion visits, I mean, you've got a, you've got a DAG and not a tree with a construction mm -hmm. computation. But it could be that when you're visiting some deeply internal node, computation node by two different paths, you're going to be visiting it with different data values because you're coming down different paths. So all the partial differentials along those two paths are going to be different. So there's no point memorizing because the calculation you're going to do at that node is going to be different depending on the path by which you reach it. So that might be why you don't need memorization. So there's some yeah, implicit, yeah. you're implicitly yeah, yeah. unrolling the, the, the DAG into a tree because every node in, in the unraveled tree Needs a separate data value in the end. Yeah, I mean, the, that sounds like kind of how we began this, where I yeah, originally yeah, tried. We did try memoization. We did discuss memoization when we did the first version. If you recall, uh, Alex, do you remember we discussed that because we were, it looked like it was being repeated, but then this didn't work out either, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like at first, when I tried this purely functionally, which I was doing for quite a while actually, right? The, the use of imperative hall probably didn't start for about a month and a uh, almost a month um it wasn't a, it, it was really like a the, the dag was actually unfolded into like a a tree where like there was actually a lot of nodes which were the same but they looked very different um and yeah i think we tried to use maybe memoization back there but yeah it it, it just it wouldn't work here because we need to go down every path and increment along the way um, and we're never going to like do the same application of the recursion twice because yeah we're just like we're just by doing the recursion from the root node down we're basically just saying explore all the paths to the leaves and the reason we want to explore all the paths to the leaves is because I, as I stated like earlier in the presentation with the way the generalized chain rule can be like um interpreted using computation graphs we need to go down every path take the path product and then add them all together and that, that's why we're incrementing along the way as we do the the backward function so i i, I don't i don't think memoization could be implemented nor would it like help because it's gonna it's gonna change every time the like values so nothing's ever gonna stay the same but i i, I could be wrong i'm not i'm not too certain Okay, thank you. Any other comments? No. Are you not implicitly memoizing by, you know, producing a, a, um, a topological sort and then only evaluating each node once and how it how its gradients are affected by its parents? Is that not implicitly memoizing it, or am I misunderstanding what's going on? Honestly, um, I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not too sure. Uh, like I guess I guess like is the use of references kind of like memoization in fact like the fact that um everything's data is like right there is that it would that be considered like memoization at all or is, um, no but memoization even from what you're saying right so the topo you're not doing the topological source so he's working recursively right I mean but it's always about storing previous computation. Yeah. But usually to prevent reusing the same computation, like redoing the same computation twice. So in this case, if you are memorized, if you are doing the topological sort, you basically turn it down into the order of the tree. Yeah, it might be in this case. I think it's because you're not referencing. Yeah. You're referencing, you're recurring design through the structure. Yeah. But the actual data you're accessing 
Well, it's even behind your reference, so I don't think it's computer. Well, well, so that is the point of doing it in that way to some extent. Yeah. yeah. But I think Paul was talking about the purely functional, were you? What were you talking about? No, no, no. no. I'll have to look at it. But yeah. it just has, it's, it's, I guess you could see it as memorization compared to the insane idea of doing a, like a full tree recalculation per node. Like for every node, visiting everything above it again. In which case, yes, this is memorization right. compared to that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. By using references and like uh, changing the like being able to update the gradient of the nodes along the way, we're basically like saving our progress as we go down through the recursion rather than like having to return something new every time we do a recursion. So I believe the references are really um, making sure that the program isn't being like insanely inefficient when we're doing the recursion. I think it's doing the heavy lifting, the, uh, the kind of like grad field, which is a reference or the reference to the valve. Very good point. Anything else? Any other? Oh, so I'm, I'm assuming that Isabel has some definition of gradient for real value functions, right? Like the mathematical mm -hmm. gradient. So do you have a sense of how hard would it be or if it would be possible at all to map your implementation of gradient to somehow you know, transport it to reals and prove that it's actually the, the gradient, like the mathematical gradient. Um. So, so basically, uh, so just to check, so you're asking, basically, could we make a grad a uh, real rather than rational? Well, I understand that you want to compute with with rationals, but then, like, if you could somehow prove that this actually, in some sense, corresponds to the yeah. maths. But you should be gradient. able to do that because the gradients are all defined over uh, type losses. So you would, it would just be an instance of whatever. So it doesn't care. So it's about, I don't, do you see what I mean? So, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sure that uh, within like the theorem, which is actually trying to prove that like grad is correctly calculated yeah. uh, with the backward function, um, we could have like the real valued analog of whatever's going on in the rational sense and show that that uh, calculated grad value, which is a rational, is equal to the, the like the real partial derivative. Yeah. yeah. So we can have like an analogous function going on in the theorem and show that those two things, the calculated rational grad and the like theoretic real valued derivative are both equal. And I feel like that would be a satisfactory answer. Because yes, yes, no, yeah, we can't yeah. we can't turn grad rational, but we can show the rational is equal to the real value, the real counterpart. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's what I was asking. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that that should be possible. Yeah. Any other? No. Okay. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. 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 Yes. When you say heap more out, um, do you? This is not an intra Isabel thing. It's when you say more out, you mean to say something about the heap as a data type, but Isabel doesn't know anything about monads. Uh, I think it is a monad. It does get translated into monads yeah. outside. Uh, 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 I mean, yeah. the whole theory uh, of monads. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm definitely no expert in monads. In fact, this summer was the first time I really understood why you would use uh, like monads in functional well, programs. You didn't have to fill what you oh, no, didn't have to fill what this course, did you? I guess. <laughs> uh, but um, the yeah, it certainly is a monad. Like it follows all the monadic laws um, that can define monads. And I don't know. It basically you have functions which have return values, but they're then wrapped in this like exterior type called a uh, capital heap, I believe. And that is the heap monad. And it's basically just protecting a potential failed computation um like so that you can still pass it functionally uh i mean like i can't remember the exact definition of what the heap monad but it's like a pair it's like the heap the current heap and the resultant like value from a computation or it's like the word none so it's kind of like the classic maybe monad from haskell but just jazzed up slightly if that makes sense 
Yeah, um, so is there a point in Isabel where you say if is a monad and then you prove that? It generates a proof of it? No, 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 no. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a monad to the same degree that like the option type ends yeah. out PMS yes, and all that. So when you have monad, custom syntax, a, but you don't prove yeah. it as a theorem. So yeah. when you say monad, it's something that you know, but Isabel doesn't know. Right, and I see what you mean. Yeah. Because otherwise, that would be great. <laughs> you cannot reason about it as an object, you mean, yeah, like because, this. Because yeah. Isabel. Yeah. I, I see what you're at. Uh, so, uh, so oh, first class, so first class is a bell. Yeah. yeah. So you can't. Sorry. Because <laughs> it was talk on Tuesday by oh, the differentiation Apple, one, which was the differentiation one. Well, uh, so if you yeah. could just do all of this in a single one, that yeah, would be yeah. nice. But so, then it wouldn't actually save anything. Yeah. But so yeah. I, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. So I don't think there. I don't remember ever happening across like a as instance of monad proof for the heat monads in the imperative hall file but that actually seems kind of weird now that i think about it like so but uh, i i i suppose you, are you interested in knowing how you would prove something as a monad within as well because it's like it's quite challenging uh like what, what um because yeah I, i'm now not sure maybe it's not possible uh to do a heat monad uh, like a proof that it is a monad or they've not provided it well it's Constraint on the thing that you were referencing. Something has to be countable, and Isabel is usually very bad at um, doing anything that doesn't work with all the types. <laughs> yes. you can't, yeah, because it doesn't know about yeah. the, 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 the of types. sort constraints so just on all the functions. So right, you can right. technically define right. it. Right. I think we need to stop. Yes. It's getting very nerdy now, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, any other questions? Oh, no, it's good, but it can be more uh, focused discussion. Yeah. Uh, uh, anybody else? Anything else? Alex, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think just